So the first thing I had to do when I was thinking about doing a lightning effect was what tool can I use in Blender to create random lightning spikes as easily and as quickly as possible. And so I went through some of the add-ons and the add-on that I found to be the most helpful in this and what I used in my effect is the Ivy Generator. So that's going to be our first job, which is to enable the Ivy add-on, if you haven't used it before. So I'm going to go File, User Preferences, over to the Add-ons tab, and I'm just going to type in Ivy, and then tick the box, and that will enable the Ivy add-on. Now what this does is add an item to the Add Curve menu, and you see we've got Add Ivy to Mesh, but currently it's greyed out. And that's because of two things. Firstly, we haven't got objects selected to apply the IV2. And secondly, even if this was selected, we can't use it yet because it's still as a text object. So I'm just going to reduce the resolution down. It doesn't matter too much because we won't actually be rendering this, but it just makes it a little easier if we've got a simpler mesh to deal with. So then I'm going to press Alt-C and choose Mesh from Curve. And I'm just going to go into Edit Mode, W, Remove Doubles just to simplify the mesh a bit. Now the second thing we've got to consider is that I don't just want the IV to go along the text, I want the IV to go along the floor. So I have a floor plane set up to fit inside my camera view, and when we use the IV it'll only apply it to one object, so we need to merge these all into one object so the IV will grow along both at the same time. So I'm going to shift select the two objects, Control J just to join them into one mesh, and then we can go into front view Shift A, Add Curve, and then Add Ivy to Mesh. Now, you may just be able to see this, we've got some tiny amount of Ivy just at the front here, and that's because it grows from the 3D cursor, and what you'll notice is that it's growing upward, but what we want is for spikes of lightning to come down and from the sides, and if I just delete this Ivy, just by doing a box selection and deselecting the text, deleting. The ivy will only grow upwards and we want it to go downwards and sideways. So to get around this we're going to actually have to do this part upside down. So I'm just going to press R, 180, and we've got it upside down. And that's so when I place the cursor here, because that's where I want the origin of the ivy to grow from, it will grow upwards onto the mesh. And that's just a tiny quirk of the way we've got to do this. So I'll bring up the toolbar because this is where the uh, IV options are going to appear and I'll expand this bottom part. And now that we're ready, Shift A, add curve, add Ivy to the mesh. The first thing we want to do is remove the leaves, so I'll just untick that. And each time you want to see a change to the Ivy, it won't update automatically, you have to press the update Ivy button. So just pressing that, it's now removed the leaves. Now some of the other settings we have to change are the max IV length, and I'm going to set this to 6. You should play around with your own settings, because I just happen to know that these settings will work for me. If you're working at a different scale, you may have to play around with these settings, but it is fairly easy to do. The second setting is just the IV size, just to push that up a bit. I'm also going to put the max float length up to 5, and just to explain what that does. That allows the IV to grow upwards without coming into contact with an object. So this effectively tells the ivy to look in a bigger range for an object to grow around. If we had this a small amount like we just did, it won't go anywhere because it can't find an object to grow against. Putting this number up says look in a wider area, and so it'll grow towards our object. One other option I'm going to change is the adhesion weight, and I'm just going to bump that up a bit, and that just says make the ivy cling to the text a bit more. If we didn't do that, it would probably grow around it a bit and then go off a bit into midair because we've put the float length up. Now that the settings are on, I'm just going to update the ivy, and you can see we have the, the basics of a lightning spike. Now, I'm just going to tweak a few of these settings. We need a bit more ivy around this, and what I'm actually going to do is rotate the view so we can see what we're actually looking at. So here, just as we want, we've got the lightning coming down. It's not quite enough yet, so I'm just going to bump up a few of these settings. And so I've just tweaked a few of these settings. The main one I had to reduce was the float length. It was a bit too much. And I also reduced the scale so it just spreads out a bit. But now that we've got our initial uh, lightning setup, we can now move the cursor to a new position. 
because I wanted multiple uh, lightning bolts to come down. And then I'm going to click Add New Ivy. And it copies all of our previous settings, except it still has Grow Leaves on. And in fact, I'm just going to move the cursor a bit closer because we're getting a lot of weird bunching. Then I'm going to update. And in fact, I'm actually going to up the adhesion weight a bit just for this one. So it's actually going to the surface a bit more and it can probably go even higher. So that's about right. And what we then do, we just move around, add new ivy, remove the leaves and update it. And just continue to do that as many times as you want for as many lightning bolts as you need. And what we really want to do is make sure all parts of the mesh are covered at some point by ivy because that's what's going to be making the shape, the appearance of the ivy, rather than this actual mesh. So just moving the cursor to different points in the mesh, forwards and backwards, to make sure we cover the sides that we want. And it is a bit unpredictable, so just play around. You get res different results every time, and it just takes a bit of tweaking to make sure you get the right result, or the result you want. And one thing to remember is that if you do any operation uh, in Blender, so if you move something or scale it or rotate it, these settings will actually disappear, and you'll actually have to manually add another IV curve and then put all the settings in again. So that's just something to remember. So we can hide this now. We've got most of our IV done. We can rotate everything the right way up. So I'm just going to box select everything, change my rotation point to the active element. So I'm rotating around the 3D text, R 180, and we should be back to the right position. But now we've got all our lightning. So now that we've got all these curve objects, we can actually um, make them a bit thicker. I'm going to change the bevel depth to 7, and it'll just thicken up all our curves. So I'm going to Control C to copy that value, and then just drag our uh, outliner down and paste that value onto each one. I'm then going to add a new material, so we don't need the outliner anymore. New material, I'm going to choose a very bright blue, remove the uh, specular because lightning doesn't need it. And I'm going to put the emit value, which is going to light the other objects later on, to 1. And you can see it's got a lot brighter. And then if I just select all our other objects, and then select the one with the material last, and then do Control L, and we're going to link the materials together. So now you can see all our lining very clearly. I'm just going to edit our original object, and I'm just going to hover over the mesh, press L, and press L over this one. So they're selected, press P, and we're going to separate by selection because we don't actually want um, this text to render, but we do want the floor to render. So I'm going to press Control H to hide it from the render, and then H to hide it from the view. And what we're left with is kind of a shell that represents our text. And obviously, if I'd spent a bit of more time doing it and a bit of fine tuning, it would have looked a lot better, but you get the impression from this. Something I'd also do is actually go into some of the meshes that overlap, like this one. It's gonna, It looks a bit dense. And then if you're just using the L key again, just tap L as you move the cursor over it, press delete and then selection. You can delete a lot of it, but keep the main structure. And it just thins out and we've already got a better view here of what the text is. And you may wanna do that down here as well. It really depends on what you want it to look like in the end. So the next part is to deal with the animation, and this really is quite an easy part to do, so there shouldn't be any problems with this. What we're going to be doing is animating the visibility of the object, and we're actually going to be animating the properties in the outliner. So you can actually put a keyframe on the visibility and the render visibility. Now, we don't want it in the render, so you may think we'd only do the render visibility. But if we do that, then we can't see the animation update in the timeline, then we don't know what's appearing and when and what's happening or why. So we need to do both. 
but this should become a bit clearer as we continue. So I'm just going to go back to the beginning of the animation and actually on frame zero, so it's actually before our timeline, I'm going to make this object invisible and press I and then repeat that. So I'm just clicking to make it invisible and then I to add a keyframe. And we're then going to do the same for our render options. So now our objects are neither visible in the viewport nor will they be visible in the render. Now you may think, well, how are we going to animate it if we can't see it? Well, we've put keyframes in, so they're going to be visible in the graph editor. So we're going to split the view, go to our graph editor, and we can see all our objects are listed. Now, if I just select the first one, and at a minute, it's just a flat line, which means it's staying at that value and it's invisible. So what we're going to do is add a modifier, and we're going to choose noise. We're going to leave it on replace, but we're going to set the, if I just expand this out, the scale to five, the strength to 20. You can see this big spike is happening and what this is doing is basically giving a, a random value and it should switch the object on and off. So if I go through the timeline you can see one of our meshes is going on and off according to this noisy line we've created. So basically we want to replicate this on all others and instead of doing it by hand we can press this button to copy the modifier up to the clipboard, select our other channels, and then we can paste them all on at once. So we click on each one, you can see we've got the line. So now if I expand the 3D view again, you can see we've got disappearing and appearing lightning. But again, this isn't really what we want because they're all appearing and disappearing at the same time. And that comes from this little value called phase, which is the random value that we're giving. So it's the random value which generates this spiky line, but we want a different spiky line for each channel to give it a bit more randomness. So as this is item two in my list, I'm going to give this a phase value of two, and this one a value of two, and this three, and this three, and then this four, and so on. And the reason why we're doing this is it's just an easy way to give a unique random number to each one. You can use any number, but this just ensures that they're all getting different ones. And then the last one, eighth object, is going to have a random phase of eight and eight. So if we go back to the beginning, scrub through, you can see everything is appearing and disappearing at different times. If we had only animated the render icons, we would be seeing no change in the viewport and we'd only see a change in the render. And if we'd only animated the visibility, we would see the changes in the viewport and not in the render. So we've done both and it was very easy to do them all at once because of that uh, very handy paste value and that makes it very easy to do. So now if we look in the camera, we can actually close this uh, graph panel down. We don't need that anymore. And if we just give it a playthrough, you can see we've basically got random lightning. And again, it's worth just going in and fine tuning all this ivy. And it's something I didn't really have time to do during the tutorial, but you really should go in, fine tune all the settings to get a nice text outline. And you can see the impression of it here, but it's not quite the full effect. So the last thing to do is set up the render settings. We added that material, which is um, the emit value. We set it to one. And to use that, we're going to go over to the World tab, turn on indirect lighting, which allows other objects to light other objects if they have an emit value. Change it to approximate because it only works with approximate. And I'm going to add a slight fall off, which just turns the, the effect down a bit. And then if I give that a render, you can see that we've got lightning and it's lighting up the floor and giving it a bit of a glow. Now the last thing to give a bit of a nice effect I like to do is a bit of compositing and this just gives a bit of added glow and fine tunes the colour. So I've just gone to the uh, node editor, clicked on compositing, we want to use nodes, we want a backdrop so we can see our effect. And I'm going to join these up and then I'm going to shift A and add an output viewer and again join that up and we can see our result. So I'll just zoom in with Alt V 
and I'm going to add a filter blur because this is how we're going to create our glow. Send it to Gaussian and we'll try 5 and 5 and we should probably link it up to the viewer so we can see the effect. You can see it's blurred it out. It might be too much but we'll see. We'll then add a colour mix and we're going to put that in there and there and it's mixing it with white so we're not seeing anything but we want to mix it with its original non-blurred self and then I'm going to change that to add and you can see the effect. I'm just going to turn that down to 0 0.8 and in fact I can turn the glow down a bit just by controlling that. Final thing I'm going to do is a bit of uh, colour correction colour, hue and saturation, drop that in there and I like to reduce the saturation of the original object so the glow is a slightly different colour so I'm just going to reduce the saturation so our original object is white and our glow is more blue so that's roughly it just do a final render and make sure you have uh, compositing on to see the compositing effect I'm going to render that and there we have it we've got lightning which you obviously should fine tune to get a, a nicer, cleaner text outline. So I hope that was useful to some people. It's quite a nice effect and really the most complicated part of it and the thing you want to spend the most time on is creating the text outlines. If you have any other suggestions for tutorials please leave them in the comments and if you found this useful or if you think I can use something better please also say that in the comments and I hope to see you in the next tutorial. Goodbye.